Hi, this is Wild Nick Brown, and you're listening to Focus on Metal. Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, welcoming you to another week of Focus on Metal. And this week, as I had talked about last week, we welcome back author Jim Santora. The last time we had Jim on the show, it was for the July 4th, 2019 episode, episode 425. If you want to go up to focusonmetalpod.com with a little one we called Summer Reading Metal Edition. And on that one, he was double guesting with another one of our uh, constant guests, author Martin Popoff. But for that one, in episode 425, he was on there for his book, Underrated Rock Book. And this week, Jim is back on with us talking about Underrated Rock Book 2, 200 More Overlooked Albums. So this one comes out uh, a few weeks from now, October 12th. And if you like the first one, then you will absolutely like the second one. And if you haven't read the first one, it doesn't matter. It's not like these are in a series or whatever. It's just another flavor of the first one. So go get this one. And if you like this one, you go, hey, you know what? I like it enough to go pick up the first one. And, you know, I also put this book into a category and it means no disrespect to the book whatsoever. But this is one of those great books that you could have sitting in the bathroom and you can just pick it up at any time and leaf through it and go, oh, yeah, that album or that band or whatever. It isn't something you have to read front to back in order. I did, but that's not necessarily what you need to do. So you could just pick this up anytime. Jim likes to describe it in the interview as a coffee table book. It's good sitting on the coffee table. Someone picks it up, flips through it, sees something, sparks a discussion or memory, whatever. So either way, but uh, a great book and a worthy successor to underrated rock book. So that rather than just having me babble on about this, I think that we cover it pretty well in the interview. And amazingly... Uh, It's been quite a while, but actually, I'm doing the interview this week as well. Can you freaking believe that? So, out of my sort of self-imposed interview exile and bring you my interview with author Jim Santora. And as an added bonus for the first time in God knows I don't know how long, I get to use this little bumper I made years ago. Hey, metalheads, kick back, relax. Raise the horns and stay tuned for another original Focus on Metal, Metal Side Chat, with your host, Scott Thompson. Hello. Hey, Jim. How we doing? Hey, Scott. How you doing? Okay. Good to hear from you. Yeah, you too. I can't believe I haven't talked to you since June of 2019, if you can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I could, I could, I could believe it. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on between now and then. So. Uh, yeah, you know, and it was, it was weird because you know, I, I, reading the press release reminded me when the original book came out and stuff, and I was thinking it couldn't have been that long. It couldn't have been back to 2018. But then I, I looked and I'm like, oh yeah, June of 2019, I talked to you. Yeah, yeah, great to talk mm-hmm. to you again, and uh, I'm, I'm definitely psyched that you've got a second edition to this. Yeah, I mean, this one obviously took a little bit longer to do than the first one, for sure. But, um, yeah, I took my time with it, and finally it uh, I made it. I mean, a lot of there was a lot of people that I kept asking if there was going to be a second book, and then eventually it, eventually I got I finally sat down and took care of it. So, yeah, uh, I don't want anybody asking me for a third book, though, <laughs> but, you know. Well, you've, you've got enough bands in that list at the end. You certainly could get a third one out. Probably pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. Well, there's. You know, it's funny. I, I should probably the next book should be for the ones that I in, that I did not include in the first two books. <laughs> I should just go and find an album from each artist. That would be that would be interesting. So. There you go. So for, first <laughs> off, I, I got to give you thanks for for uh, giving us a mention in in the credits up in the front. I really appreciate that. That meant a lot yep. to me. Absolutely. So I, I definitely appreciate that. And, you know, I got to tell you, I don't think I told you this the first time that I was talking to you, too. One thing I really love about these books, and I think it hit me more weirdly 
with this one than it did the first one is way back when I was playing in bands all the time, I had mm-hmm. one band where we kind of had this bizarre motto that we were obviously shit faced tonight. We thought of it, but it was kind of like a thousand and one of your, of your patriotic favorites that you've completely forgotten about. And the, the whole thing with the band was that, and, and you know, from playing bands too, that a lot of times, if you've got yeah. originals, you got to do the, I'm going to play almost all covers. And I'm going to throw a little bit of my originals in here as well. Right. And, right. Yeah. And especially both of us, we're on the East coast. We've had this, we, we know what this scene is like. And, yeah. um, and I just remember that we, you know, I used to have this thing where we wanted to make it like we would play not just the regular covers everybody was playing. They were covers, but they would be the thing that everybody would listen to and go, oh, shit, I remember that song. I love mm-hmm. that song. Yeah. And yep. and reading through the ones in this one, it really hit me. And the other part of it, too, was the other band that we used to play a lot with this other band where their guitar player used to do all of our um, would engineer our albums and our live shows. And we would uh, do road crew for, for their band and okay. their, their wrap up song was head East's never been any reason. And I noticed that head East made your list at the end. And, uh, uh-huh. but that was another one where people would, you just forget about that song. And all of a sudden they would blow right. this thing out at the end and everyone would, would lock into it. And for some reason, this second book really brought me back to that whole concept of, you know, wanting to do those songs that everyone would go, Oh yeah, I remember that song. And I, I think maybe yeah. it's the selections you had in here. Yeah. Well, I, I will say that in the, after the first one had been out for a while and, and you know, and I, and I, and I sit there and would read the different reviews and stuff. And it was interesting when so there was one guy put a, on an Amazon review, he put a long, like just some long review and just said, you know, he, the one thing he said was dig deeper <laughs> is what he said. Like it was, it was like a two star rating or whatever. And then he was like, he mentioned a couple bands and I was like sitting there thinking like, yeah, yeah okay. And then I would listen to him and I was like, no, nah, they're not making the book, right? But it was like his opinion. But then he was like, dig deeper. At one point, at one point, the the the, the working title of the book was called A Deeper Dig. <laughs> and because and 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 literally, like, I mean, I started. I mean, the first book kind of got me to a point, and then you know, as soon as I was finished, then it was like. Oh crap! Then I'm starting to talk about these other these other bands, right? And they're like, "Oh my head!" And I'm like, "Sitting so there going, you know." And that that's kind of the only reason why the second book even came to light was because after a while, you start compiling a whole other list of bands, or you heard a song and it's like, "Crap!" And then uh, and then even in some of the research I did, I'd go through something else, and then I would sidetracking just go to a different band. Or a different artist, or I'd hear a song like, "Man, I remember that song," but you know, or you heard the song, and you didn't remember the artist, right? And then it just, it just it just kept snowballing from there. So, I mean, my list. I mean, I can kind of go through. We talk when we get into the actual um, piece here, but it's like, you know, it's just so much, uh, so much stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And, yeah, and the other part too, I think, is that. You know, I, I look at a lot of what you have in here, and it's crazy too that you've got two hundred basically underrated rock releases, and you fit them all within one hundred and sixty four pages, which is incredible as it was that you kept being yeah. pretty succinct about it. Mm-hmm. But that I also look at it too of of like you, I used to be on on terrestrial radio. And I look at a lot of these and go, yeah, these are the kind of things, too, that when I had my show that I could be, it wasn't quite a way deep cut, but it was a deeper cut than a lot of things that were getting played at the time. And I kind of I kind of see it this way, too. So when you tell me somebody gives you a two-star review and says, dig deeper, that's kind of a, to me, it's kind of more of a easy to say elitist comment more than a yeah. real good, mm-hmm. you know, helpful feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you know the uh, you know, and and again, I always will throw in there that there's a disclaimer. The whole the whole point of the book is a uh, you know it's it's a, it's a talking piece and it's a debate piece. And you know, I would love to have some. I mean, I love to have people sit there and tell me 
you know, hey, you picked the wrong album, mm-hmm. right? Well, wh- why, you know, why is, uh, you know, one album from this band, do you feel is more underrated than something else? And and it probably have, and everybody would have valid arguments about it, and everybody could agree to disagree, right? right. So, you know, there's, there's that piece to it. And, you know, the other thing with this book, and even though, like, uh, you know, I, I called it Underrated Rock Book 2, but... Um, you know, and instead of the number two, I use the, the you know the, the word two mm. because really you could you could start it either you could start either way on e, you know what I mean if you didn't have the first book and you start with the second you could easily go back to the first book yep. because I don't think there's a right or wrong because the first one just said hey, it's 200, 200 overlooked albums but you know without you know obviously the first one does have a list there that says hey here's the fifteen albums you must listen to. Mm-hmm. Because in my opinion, I said these are the most underrated albums, right? But really, in in reality, you could you could start with this book and then go back to the first one, right? And then kind of kind of interchange them. So there's no there's no like you know this is the holy grail and all oh, this is the second level, right? Right. So right. And and I look at this too as a a, a good kind of kind of uh, I don't want to call it avenue of discovery. That one of the things I like about all your entries in here, and you did this in the first one too, is, you know, you've got now um, a whole generation of kids that have just kind of been fed that monthly playlist on, you know, whatever station they're listening to that's owned by Clear Channel and only plays those same 15 songs all day. And they're starting to want to find other things. And what I like on this is that you always give like trails back to what this band might be resemble or what its lineage is and things. So it gives these little trails back of someone going, Oh, I, I heard of that band. Oh, I should check out this one. Cause it's, it's coming off of that too. And, and I like that you do that in, in a ton of the entries in here. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's some points here where, you know, you got to kind of look at the, the history or the bands that kind of, you know, the time frame of where those bands were mm. and who were some of the other bands. Like, you know, you may have heard of the, you know, the top bands that were obviously getting played on the radio or being on MTV. But then, you know, here's this other lesser known band that probably should have, if it wasn't for those bands, maybe could have been a little bit bigger. So it's, you know, it's kind of going through that and then also kind of tying back some history, kind of going back, especially when you have, you know, artists where, you know, maybe an artist that was doing something else and then they got into this other band, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, whether it was, whether it was a super group or whether it was, uh, you know, a spin off of another band or even uh, some of the solo projects, for example. Right. Where, you know, where you have somebody that just kind of steps out on his own after being in, you know, being in a band for the last, uh, you know, 20 years or whatever, and then kind of steps on his own and does his, does does his or his or her own thing. Right. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. The selection of this one here, I'm just, I'm going through. And for a lot of them, it was like, oh yeah, I freaking love that album. Or it was like, hmm, do I remember that one? But this one, yeah, it provoked a lot of thoughts and, and it actually kicked off really early too, because you you have Airborne, Running Wild. Mm-hmm. I that When that album came out, that thing was just freaking awesome. And, and you really did kind of lay that in too where you you know you put that statement in that somewhere between acdc and the angels is yep. airborne and and you know you might toss it up and say it's the angels or it's rose tattoo or but i mean it it perfectly succinctly sticks where these guys were in and the energy and stuff that they had on that album and, and i was like okay I, i'm fully in as soon as i heard that i'm like i'm locked into this book and yeah i read the whole thing one shot i just once that locked me in i was done yeah i mean and just taking that one album as as one of many examples that you can kind of pull from this book and mm-hmm. you know and and the things that i look at when i'm and even if it's you know a band like airborne where i remember the day the first time i heard that band mm-hmm. and then you know, went and picked up the uh, picked up the CD. You know, and cranked this thing up, and you're just kind of blown away by your sound. And you know, and and I, you know, you kind of you kind of sit there and go like, well, where did they? You where did they get this from? Like, obviously, it's an Australian thing, right? It's a mm-hmm. ACDC thing. And and if you really read the stories about a lot of bands, I remember some article where you know a lot of bands even talking about like Midnight Oil and things like that, where they all kind of have. Even though they may not sound like ACDC, they all have the same 
like the vibe yeah. of you know like their their sounds, right? And maybe that's just you know maybe that's just being in Australia and being part of that music scene. Um, but yeah, that that was that's just one of many examples of where you know me listening, you know, for years and years of of music, and then you know, kind of going back and and uh, even in a lot of the research, you know, I could listen to a band like Airborne and then find some other band, right? That all of a sudden, like, wow, why haven't I heard this before, right? right. And that's that's kind of the thing about uh, the beauty of this book. And even from the first book was just the matter of not so much of the one of the bands that I knew and the bands I've heard of, but even the ones that then caught my attention. And then it was like, wow, why didn't I hear about this band 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago for yeah. that matter? Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, and then there was even some that are even within the last 10 years, there was, you know, there were some bands that kind of pop in there like, you know, wow, I, you know, I'm surprised that these, this band isn't as big or should be bigger than, than, than what they are. You know, some of them are one and done, you know, that's an, a great album, but then, you know, stuff happens. They, they tend to uh, break up or, you know, uh, never, never get an opportunity to uh, put out a second release or, or whatever it is. And, you know, and it's, a, and, and, and it's a shame because then not anybody uh, gets the opportunities to, uh, you know, get to listen to those bands. So hopefully people pick up when they pick up these books uh, and then especially the, the, you know, this, this new one, um, you know, and, and sit there and, and give these bands an opportunity to uh, listen. And that's kind of the whole point of the, the books in general is that you can kind of sit there and go in and go through each one of these. And then if you're not familiar with them, you know, and, and I'm not asking anybody to go run out and, you know, all of a sudden bulk up their CD or album collections for stuff. Cause some of this stuff, you can't even find, mm -hmm. or if you could find it, some of them, you know, when you do find them, they're, you know, rarities that are a hundred, two hundred dollars, right. Yeah. To go pick up for a CD and stuff. But you know, Hey, if you find them on Spotify or if you have the opportunity to kind of sit there, read, listen, and then kind of decide for yourself, man, that's pretty cool. There's some pretty cool stuff here. Um, maybe I want to go look for that and add that to my collection. Yeah. And, 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 and if the books, if the books do that, then they're really, they are really doing its job because, you know, then there's a musical appreciation for somebody that A, enjoys music enough that they want to pick up this book and then B, be able to uh, then take that and go to the next level, right? right? Listen to it, appreciate it, and appreciate it to the point where they'll actually go out and search it and add it to their collection, tell their friends, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So like one of them that, that you know, you talk about stuff like that that's in here is um, is Black Tide with uh, Light From Above. When that yeah. album came out, I played that thing till I think my kids were ready to kill me. And I absolutely just loved that album. And and it's one of these things too where it's going to be really hard to find now because they just they don't continue to press all the time. And I don't think that my ex wife is ever going to hand it over to me. So it's kind of like crap. <sighs> and I, you know, I think that's one of these ones where I am going to have to do some searching and hopefully find a copy of it. But yeah, this is that's another one that popped up to me. It was like, oh my god, yeah, and and no lie it was weeks and weeks of literally that was always in the car playing all the time just that band came out of nowhere and it was incredible so it was great to see it in the book and 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 and, and i still remember the first time i had heard you know when i heard black tide and you know just the kind of the way they were being presented like they were this band that we would somehow remember or at least the influences that they carried were some of that, you know, old school 70s meets early 80s hard rock, you know, somewhere in there, there's early Motley Crue sound, their early, or, or even like the Guns N' Roses uh, type stuff. And, you know, when you really listen to them, you're like, wow, this is great. And then even, even to find out that these guys are barely, you know, out of high school. Right. Right. That they're, that they're like, I think the youngest member at the time was maybe 14, 15 years old. And there's, you know, we have plenty of examples of bands that were that young that were, you know, got a lot of buzz or successful. Uh, you know, another band that I'll mention, like Silverchair, was the same way mm -hmm. in the 90s when they came in and they just kind of destroyed. And then when you found that the guys were like 14, 15 years old, you were completely blown away. Like, wow, I can't believe these guys are playing like this. And 
Another great band to mention here is, of course, San Francisco's own Death Angel. Black Tide was like that. I still remember seeing Black Tide live, doing the stuff off of here, and people were just eating it up. It was amazing. And I thought that I thought the ceiling was so high for this band. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, and, um, you know, they're playing like one of the festival shows that's out there. And like the next thing you know, they kind of like turned around and kind of became what, you know, I don't know. I don't even know if it was like, I guess they kind of got like a metal core thing and stuff like that. And it's just like when you saw what they did, you know, with light from above, and then you fast forward a few years later, and now they're kind of in the scene that's kind of already going on. It's like, whoa, what just happened here? Right. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that kind of is what kind of lost me on that band because there was so much of a ceiling where this, this album and this band in general should have been so much bigger than what they were mm, because, right. you know, in, in a sea of bands that were still kind of, you know, I guess you kind of had still up a post grunge and a metal core and, and some other types of, uh, you know, stuff as far as metal and hard rock would go, you know, they kind of came in and, you know, almost like, you know, around the same time as Airborne, right? Airborne comes in and they kind of have that ACDC kick-ass style. You know, Black Tide comes in and says, hey, we got this, you know, we kind of got this early, early hard rock style and it's in your face and all that stuff. And, and I think there was a huge market for that. Um, obviously, they didn't kind of achieve the levels that, you know, I, I personally think they should have been. But, you know, it was, it was very disappointing to see that they kind of transformed into something else. And I think they, they unfortunately lost the fan base because of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, another cool thing that I, I thought was a, was a nice addition on this one is that you did change the rules from your uh, from your original scope of the year. So you dropped back some years and you went forward. And then the other cool thing was that you decided you were going to throw in some soundtracks. And that definitely was, and not like you went crazy. There aren't a ton of them in there, but I think you really got some key stuff in there. And one of them that really was made me have a huge smile on my face is that you had the rock star soundtrack. Cause that is definitely one of these things front to back. What a, what a great soundtrack. And um, yeah, I, I, I was psyched to see that one in here. Yeah, and and one of the things that I wanted to do with this book, and I and and I knew I needed to kind of change the rules up a little bit and kind of open things up. The first one, I, I definitely wanted to be a little bit more kind of tight with like the time frame, and I wanted to kind of go with you know I'm, I'm I was born in 1969, so you know I and and, and I kind of got into music uh, you know at, at at an early age. I can still remember you know having 45s that my mother would buy. You know, when I was about four or five years old and just, you know, play stuff on the turntable because she would give them to me. You know, it's like the early, you know, early meatloaf or early Beatles, you know, or, mm-hmm. or I should say late Beatles, kind of like that, you know, before they broke up kind of stuff. And, you know, Monkeys albums and all that kind of thing. Actually, my first LPs, Jim, were the Monkeys and Meet the Monkeys in mono. And I still yeah. have them. Yeah, I had, uh, I had, be- it was uh, Best of the Monkeys. It's the one where they're all like in red. You know, they were all wearing the red. I think it's kind of like an orange background. I mean, that was like one of the first ones uh, when I got into that band. So what I wanted to do was that there were several bands or artists that were in the 60s or at least the late 60s that I felt there were things that I could include uh, into this book. And, and some of them were a little more research. Because in a lot of cases, like in a case like the Monkees, it was only really like a, a couple of years ago. Like I was into, I was into the band a lot. Like when I was a kid, obviously you watched the TV show because it was on, you know, at that point it was on syndication in the early seventies, right? So, um, and then I got to see Mickey Dolenz and Mike Nesmith live, and this was before, this was pre-pandemic, right? So, what was interesting was, you know, they're kind of doing their songs, you know, because it's just the two of them. Now, they were the last surviving numbers. Obviously, uh, Mike Nesmith passed away, recently passed away, not that long ago. Uh, but when the two of them played, Mike Nesmith is playing all of the songs that he wrote. And then you write and you see all these songs, you know, you hear all these songs like, man, I know those songs because they were on the show. But like when you start placing them on the albums, you know, then that was a thing like, okay, you know, then there's, you know, there's a monkey. Then now I'm doing a research on a monkeys, for example. To say, man, there's somewhere here. There's there's a there's a set there's an album in here that 
you know, is somewhere it's, it's underrated and it's underrated because of like Nesmith's work. Right. Right. And then I kind of fast forwarded into the, the more into what was 20 past 2015. So 2016 to 2022. So we thought, so we do kind of the same thing there. And there's some albums that I've been able to pick up and enjoy. And I know that they're not catching a whole lot of traction as a household name. So they make the list. Now the, the, the reason for the, um, the soundtracks is that I, I started looking at things like, in, you know, in the, the main soundtracks that I had, like the rock star soundtrack, obviously, and I'll talk about that in a second, but then judgment night was another one, which was kind of the, the precursor to new metal, mm-hmm. you know, here's, here's a bunch of rock artists, you know, getting together with rappers. We had already seen it with run DMC and Aerosmith and public enemy with anthrax and, you know, now it's, uh, you know, now it was this whole thing. And it's like, man, I still remember when that, when that record came out, I was like, I was blown away. And the music, the, the, the movie actually was horrible. But the soundtrack is what everybody seems, the people that do remember that time, they remember that soundtrack. And that it was very groundbreaking to what was going to take place a few years, you know, a few years later. Right. When things start blowing up and there's a whole huge, you know, rap metal slash new metal kind of thing. Now getting back into uh Rockstar and the two of my favorite movies, you know, we can kind of go back and look at movies that um kind of kind of depicted as far as my opinion as two of my favorite involving involving music in general, whether it was a scene or whether it was just uh you know uh, a, a band or about a band and Rockstar is one of those. Singles is the other one, which uh, Singles is actually uh, celebrating a 30th anniversary. Um, but, you know, when you talk about that whole grunge alternative rock scene, you know, Singles tends to be the, the, the thing that kind of culminates that scene because it was still early enough that, you know, in all the, all the bands, you know, minus Nirvana, that were a part of that, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, uh, Pearl Jam, you know, they're all in that, in that mix. Smashing Pumpkins is in there. And then you throw a little Hendrix in there. Uh, Hart calls themselves the love, love mongers. They do a Led Zeppelin song and it's brilliant. Right. So, so that's one rock star is an amazing collection. First of all, when you take and you put together an all-star band, you know, what better, what better group of guys that you could put together that, and, you know, and first of all, just putting Zach Wilde on anything <laughs> already kind of sounds like this is going to be good, right? This is going to be really good. Then you, you know, then you, you add a Jeff Pilsen, you know? Hey, this is Jeff Pilsen and you are listening to Focus on Metal. Enjoy. Uh, you add a Jason Bonham, right? You, uh, you know, then you get your, you get your group of, um, group of singers that are, that are in there. You know, uh, you know, Mike from Steelheart and Jeff Scott Soto and, and so on. And, and, and all of a sudden, and then when you put the songs together, it's like, you know, the whole idea was about a band, you know, about a fictional band that was like larger than life. Right. You know, we, we look and think about this. We think about the bands that we've watched for years. You know, that there's these larger than life arena rock metal bands that we could sit there and play. And this comes off. As a band, when you listen to these songs, like, oh, my God, when you sit, you know, when you when you go in and you're, you know, you're listening to like, uh, you know, again, We All Die Young, Blood Pollution, you know, those songs flat out could have been set anywhere in 19, insert 1980 something, Mm -hmm. right? And they would have been huge. They would have been, they would have been eaten up by everybody that would have been a fan back in the day. And it really kind of brings back a nostalgia thing to it, but it's it's fresh. And you know, the disappointing thing was that, and I just read some article uh, recently. I forget who was uh, who was talking about it, um, but there was a whole thing where I don't know if it was like uh, we all die young or something. They were going to have something where they were going to have a single. It was going to get pushed on radio, and then nine eleven happened around the same time, and then that, that all of a sudden kind of squashed, uh, squashed a lot of singles at that point, but it kind of squashed everything because all of a sudden the world had kind of changed at that point. Yeah. Um, so it'd be really surprising to see what would have happened if that didn't take place. Um, and what I'm actually, you know, and, and then I was also hearing about, they were talking about that, that um, 
you know, Steel Dragon or the, the band that was comprised of Steel Dragon was, you know, there was always this pondering that they were going to get together and do another album and maybe do a tour. And then those things never happened either. So we only have this soundtrack. And, you know, there's some other songs on there that obviously people would know because there's the, you know, I think it's uh, Motley Crue and Bon Jovi and I think Kiss, you know, Kiss has a song on there. And, and those are all fine too. But if we're really looking at the core of this soundtrack, it's the songs that are done you know, by the band Steel Dragon, uh, the, the the one song that's done by uh, Everclear, I think is is tremendous. So yeah, so there's there's a whole collection of stuff there. It's still one of those albums that you know when I I flip through, you know, I, I'll pull that out just because you know just because of how great how great it sounds. Those, those Steel Dragon songs are incredible. Exactly, and that, and that's actually you echo how I feel about it too, which is that you know the other stuff was like, eh, it was it was the Steel Dragon stuff that was more of the wow, this is this is just really good, and and it's mm-hmm. the stuff that I tend to you know if I pop that on, that's what kind of puts a big smile on my face here and that again is that one. So yeah, yeah. So like I said, I, I was yeah. glad you expanded kind of the scope, and and I can understand why the initial one. I remember too the first time talking to you that you kind of wanted to have it based more as to you know, being born in 69 as well. But then you're doing your first book and you're trying to pick 200 songs. It's like, you, you will probably want yeah. to narrow your scope down a little bit as well. And, you know, I see that too. Like, um, you know, when Martin Popoff does some of his like, you know, best of books and stuff, he tries to put some scope in there so that he's just kind of not doing this thing forever. So yeah, I, I think right. that's a good way to go. And, and, and this one here, it's not like you went crazy opening it up either, but it did pull in some really cool stuff when you did it. Yeah, I, I think overall, you know, when you when you first start putting and and really my process was at the beginning was to kind of set some you know what you have to set the ground rules, mm-hmm. otherwise you'll be all over the place, and then you, it, you start getting frustrated, you know. So if you if you kind of keep it to a certain set of sort of certain set of rules, and the same thing, like it was, you know, if I have two hundred artists, I want to make sure that I don't keep going to the same, you know, obviously the same artist. So obviously nobody in the first book is going to be in the second book, but you know, there are some, there are some things where if, uh, you know, we have solo art, like for example, uh, Robin Zander, for example, Mm -hmm. so cheap trick, cheap tricks all shook up was in the first book. Robin Zander solo album makes the second book because that's, I, I always think that's, that's one solo album that severely gets overlooked because it's it's an album that that kind of goes into Robin Zander kind of stepping out of, into his own, and he kind of it doesn't really sound like Cheap Trick, mm-hmm. and and I think that's kind of the brilliant thing there, of where uh, you know some of the songs he did, you know there isn't that there isn't that Cheap Trick influence. There's not that Rick Nielsen songwriting piece in there and Robin singing the songs, right? Right. So that's uh, kind of that's kind of the the thing there, and 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 then, you know, the other the other thing that I did this time around that I didn't really do the last time. The other time I kind of had a book and I was scribbling stuff down and just kind of kept rolling with it. So I didn't have so I kind of had a rolling total of artists or people would suggest something and I'd write it down. This time around, I really stepped in and looked at and kind of had a spreadsheet. And started and said, let me get the spreadsheet together of albums that I want to focus on. And I actually had a list of 200 albums, uh, 200, you know, 200 artists, 200 albums. And then from there, I started going through. And, and at first I started at first and it was kind of, you know, I started going, I went A to Z. So I started doing reviews like A and then started going in. And I was like, you know what? This is ridiculous. So, so then because it was one of those things where I got into a frustrating point because it's like, Cause then you start going through and you're like, is this really an underrated book or not? Is it really overlooked? So you start questioning. So then I started going down the list, skipping things. And then as I kept doing that, I would, I would then either remember, remember another artist or an album after listening to somebody else. Um, and then I would put them at the bottom of the list. So then once I worked my way down, now I had all these other, other records. And then I started going through that. And it was actually a really good exercise because as I continued to add stuff, then my original 200 that I had on that list, a lot of those did not make it. And, and it was actually, it was actually good that that happened because I've had, I continued to go through that list. I definitely would have missed a lot of things that kind of, because really the one thing that's really hard 
about doing, you know, because it's really, an, when you really look at it, it's really an exercise, mm-hmm. you know, and I've actually been able to do this exercise twice now. But if, you know, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint because there's so much music out there. And then you try to, you know, gather all that information. And and like we, like we had just said earlier, talking about the list of artists that, that didn't make the list, right? And if I could put the two lists together between the two books, I might have close to 200 artists right. that I could sit there and say, you know what? And actually, some of the ones in the first book did make it to the second book. So there was that. But, you know, if I still was to sit there and go and look at it, you know, there's a good chance that there's another there's another book out there, right? right. The question is whether I want to continue and make this kind of book again. Uh, there, there's ideas there's ideas that I have for another book. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's quite this, but you know, if I start lining up, you know, if I start lining up additional you know albums and songs and continue making the list, then there's then there's something that that may come of that, and then you might then I might sit there and go, huh, and you know, and then you know, we come back in uh, two, three years, and here's another, you know, here's another book. Right. You know, so. Focus. I think the other thing, too, on this is that, and, and I appreciate it because of having, like, written album reviews, I look at this and go, holy crap, you just did 200, now you've done another 200, and when I go from one to the next, none of these are cookie cutter. You you don't fall into any ruts at all between one to the next. And that was always something that was a challenge for me when you when you're doing album reviews. It's like, am I using the same adjective again in like my third straight review? And I think it's you know for me at least, I know it was incredibly hard to always con- you know continue to come up with good unique ways of expressing something about an album, but you literally never repeat yourself on any of these. Each one is like its own little fresh chunk of stuff about that band and that album. And and I thought you did an amazing job on it. Well, and first, thank you. Uh, And and the one thing I'll say is I I think what kind of keeps it fresh is when I, when I, when I look at the, when I look at writing each one of these albums, I'm telling a different story Mm -hmm. and me. And and then when you kind of go through and especially when I'm going through the list, I think, and, and again, it, it's a it's a underrated rock book, right? So there's obviously there's hard rock and there's metal, mm-hmm. but then there's also some alternative rock. There's you know there's some you know some classic rock bands, some prog. So I think what helps in the writing style that I was doing is that because I'm working with so many different styles of music, that I think I don't I don't run into the same ruts. Hmm where if I was to continue to keep going and like a metal, you know, another metal review, a metal review, I think I could fall into some traps of writing the same things. And, you know, obviously the reviewing process, I'm sure if we went through the first review of this book, uh, we might have a different thing when we actually read it. Uh, I, I will give a shout out to uh, my uh, one friend, uh, Jim Mosley, who had helped uh, review the first book. And then uh, also he, uh, re- you know, reviewed underrated rock book too as well. Uh, and, and his feedback was tremendous because he actually would read certain things and say, I think you want to say this. And then I'd sit there and re- I'd read what he said and I'd be like, you know, yeah, you're right. And there was also some points when he was doing some reviews, I was already going back and re re editing some stuff. And then he would, you know, he'd have his review. So he had a copy of the book and went through and red marked everything. He's a, he's a school teacher. Mm. So it was funny to sit there and see all the red marks in the book, you know, and sit there. I'm I'm just glad he just didn't put a grade on it for me, but it was, it was great to see like some of the things that he was suggesting. And then I had already made a change. So I had already, so we were already on the same, on the same wavelength there. Yeah. Because we were already thinking about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I had changed because, you know, there were some times where I did use the same words and then it was like, okay, I got to come up, I got to kind of come up with something else because otherwise you're kind of getting to that habit of, of, you know, kind of repeating yourself and then it kind of gets a little mundane. Right. And then somebody reading it, you know, um, might sit there and go, Oh, saying that word again, or, you know what I mean? So, 
So trying to keep, you know, try to try to keep the book fresh. And, uh, you know, I, I think the combination of having, you know, having some, some good people that kind of have the same thought process, because especially not just that, you know, he was, uh, he was a teacher and, and that kind of stuff, but he also was a fan of a lot of the bands that also made this list. Right. So there was an interest there of him as he's reading it. And then, you know, even suggestions he put in there, like, man, I love this album, you know, this kind of stuff. So it was kind of, kind of good to see that I was, I was hitting all the right buttons with somebody that could just be, you know, the, uh, a potential person that would read this book. And, and, yeah. and that was, that was good to see also. Yeah. And, and I got to say too, that, you know, between what you did and what Jim did, because I have this habit and I drive people crazy with it and sometimes it's handy, but I do tend to proofread as I'm reading. And I've had, you know, a lot of books that I've read over the last couple of years that even through like major houses and, and I read through and I'm thinking, how do they let this get through? Sometimes it's like a really bad usage or a horrible spelling error or just ridiculous stuff. But yeah, I couldn't. And not that I was looking for, like I said, it just naturally, I do it. Yeah. Nothing. It was like, I couldn't find anything. And that was something that was like, wow, this is really nice. Because for me, and again, it's just, it's me, but it, it, it makes it like a jarring reading experience when you like consistently have a lot of those things happening. I, you know, I bought a book probably last year. It was about the history of Kramer and the great content in it. But the horrible part was all of the grammar and spelling errors in it really took away from yeah. everything in the book. Yeah. And you know, I, I think I look at when I start reading books now, especially after I wrote the first one uh, and then even working on this one, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think before I just used to read and not pick up a lot of the casual mistakes that would go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think obviously a lot of books, especially when they go through like a big publisher and stuff. I mean, I mean, mine's mine's independently, you know, independently. I'm not I'm not through a publisher or anything right. like that. But, you know, it's interesting, even like we mentioned Martin Pop Popoff and, uh, and Martin's a tremendous writer. Right. But even I picked up uh, a book not that long ago. There was a Rush album by album book that he did. Yep. And I remember I started reading it and like, I read one part and my, and, and I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, there's like a, some sort of, not, nah, I don't even know if it was a spelling, but some sort of grammatical error. And then it was like another grammatical error. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, this is Martin Popoff. How can this, how can this happen? Right. Yeah. Because I've read so many other things of his and, you know, I never like noticed that stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all human. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to see some people are going to see things that I'm sure people are going to pick up stuff in my book and sit there and say, you know, that's grammatically incorrect because and I and I had that in reviews people, you know, like all of a sudden they were, you know, they were, uh, you know, eighth grade, uh, eighth grade English teacher. And, you know, they're critiquing uh, the you know critiquing the writing style and, and some of that stuff I sit there and say, like, listen, I'm, you know, if. You know, I'm not the not 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 the greatest road scholar, right? But I I think I could put a couple sentences or two <laughs> together. You know, and and the things I liked a lot of the compliments that I got from the first book was where people that had read the book and then reviewed it said, you know, that the um, that it was written well, right? That that they they like it was written well, or they liked the 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 style of how I did it, right? You know, the 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 op you know the complex not complex, but you know putting together, you know, 300 word reviews, you know, really kind of stands with, with people. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, it's kind of, this is kind of like a coffee table book where you can kind of just flip to any page and then go and say, Oh, okay. Hey, here's monster magnet. Dope to infinity, right? Just right. read, you know, read the information from there. You can kind of flip through. Um, I had another friend that had gone through the first book um, and he waited a couple of years, like he didn't pick up the book right away and then he picked it up and he went through it. He literally went through it page by page and he, it took him, he told me it took him almost two months to go through the book because he literally, he read the, he read, he read about an album or read about an artist and then he would go and he would find it. Wow. And, and I thought this was the, this was the best example of how this book should be handled where you sit there and you go to the first one and then he played it. And then what happened was then he got sidetracked because then when he liked something and then he saw that the band or artist had 10 more albums 
or, you know, a couple new albums or, you know, stuff that they had, you know, a few years ago, you know, uh, before that. And then all of a sudden now he's, in, now he's engrossed in, in listening to that. Right. Um, you know, and, 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 and that's kind of the great thing that, that's about this book, that you can sit there and go through it and, um, and say, wow, you know, I'm, you know, and, you know, if I could flip through here and say, you know, I could pick, you know, if I didn't know anything about Metallica, you know, but I sit there and, you know, I put Death, Magne Death Magnetics in the book, mm -hmm. you know, if I didn't know anything about Metallica, then all of a sudden I listen to it and I'm like, oh, crap, they've been, these guys have been around since 1981. I didn't know that. Hey, let me go back and listen to their whole back catalog. Right. Right. And then, you know, kind of, you know, and kind of go, go through there. But those, that's the, that's the great part of, of doing this because I, I think what it, what it does. And actually what I've also seen, uh, because I've been, I've been to where I've had some people that were adult, you know, there's adult people like me and you, you know, telling me, Hey, can I get a copy of that book? Uh, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, cause they, they want to get an autographed copy, but they don't even want it for them. They want it for their son, Yeah, you know, because their son's in the music, he's playing an instrument, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, and so now they're, they're giving it to, you know, to their 17 year old kid or their 12 year old kid that's learning guitar, you know, because obviously there's an interest in like, Hey, you know what, maybe they'll be even more influenced by, you know, reading about some of these, some of these artists and then going back and, and, and listening, you know, to those, to those songs and, and really becoming engaged. And I think that's the really cool thing too, that it's not just a, it's just not a book that just, you know, uh, fans of, you know, some of these bands or music collectors. I, I think there's a lot where uh, some younger people can, you know, kind of, you know, they're, they're in the rock. They may not be into the newer stuff that's going on right now. Uh, and actually, you'll see that there's there's plenty of young kids out there that are driven to, you know, things that came out in the 80s and the 90s and even the 70s, mm -hmm. just because they're just not into you know, the scene that it is now, which is mostly, you know, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of pop and, and rap and, you know, even the rock stuff that's out there, there's some good, some, there's some good rock stuff out there. And obviously, you know, in the last 10 years or so in these two books, I've covered plenty of bands that are, that are newer bands, but not all of them are home runs either. You know what I mean? And, and some people just aren't into a lot of those, a lot of those styles. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot more computers than guitars in a lot of these, a lot of these <laughs> rock bands now, unfortunately. But yep. um, so yeah, so there's you know, so that's the kind of the, that's really the kind of cool thing that that I that I see that this book kind of delivers. That it's a uh, you know, it's it's a book for anybody really of 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 you know, that's a, that's a that's a fan of rock and roll, and whether you're uh, whether you're a fan that goes back you know and listens to stuff from the '60s to now, uh, or if you're just a young kid just getting hooked on whatever mom and dad listen to or whatever their, you know, their, uh, their brothers or cousins or any other family members are into, uh, I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great research book for them. Yeah, I, I definitely. And I think you're right too. You know, like, um, a few weeks ago we took my girlfriend's daughter to her first rock concert and she pretty much doesn't listen to rock. She's been listening to pop radio and whatever her friends are listening to and all of that. So we took her out to, uh, to extreme. It was the, show that the press reported that there was a riot at and there was no freaking riot because we were in the okay. front row but um she you know she'd never been to a rock show and she came out with like well did you like it and big smile on her face and it's like yeah and we hopped in the car like the next week and she wanted to hook her iphone up to my truck's radio and the first song out of her iphone was was the deftones and it was like oh. damn where'd that come from so yeah, it yeah. kind of sparked her to kind of, hey, I'm going to go listen to a few other things that these guys are listening to. And, uh, and that's great. I, I love to see that. And obviously she doesn't abandon everything else that she's been listening to, but at least it made her go, oh, wow, I discovered this new thing. I felt pretty good mm -hmm. listening to it. Let me check out some more of it. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the one amazing thing is, I mean, there's so much music out there. Hmm. And I, I think in, uh, as far as American radio goes it's very hard to find some good rock stations oh yeah it's 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 dead for for us on the east coast it's a wasteland yeah. there's, there's still some like great indie stations like out in texas and stuff but here yeah. you're right it's 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 a wasteland 
Yeah, and it's like, you know, we, you could, I mean, obviously there's a lot of good internet radio stations out there. Uh, you know, there's there's podcasts, you know, like yourself that, you know, kind of still continue to carry the torch and spread the word and all that kind of stuff. You know, but it's like, you know, where are the avenues? That's And, and that was another thing, like with this book, you know, because even the first one, when I said, you know, rock, rock is not dead, right? You just got to find, you just got to find, you know, where the rock is, right? And it's like... And I almost kind of look at this as like if you were an archaeologist and you were trying to look for dinosaur dinosaur bones or whatever it is, you know, this is this is you know this is the rock. This is the rock that you're going to to you know kind of you know crack the earth and 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 see what see what shakes out. Yeah. And you know, and with my kids and my kids my kids are older. I have uh, I have a I have a 21 year old daughter. I have a 25 year old son. But both of them got into more rock music during the time. And a lot of it was, you know, when, um, when I would have them because it was, uh, me and my first wife, we had, we had, we had split up. So of course I had time with them. And a lot of that time was spent going in and, you know, going into my record collection hmm. and pulling out and pulling out an Iron Maiden greatest hits. Or pulling out the you know uh, meteora from Lincoln Park and things like that. Yeah. And my son, you know, then my son, my first concert, you know, the first concerts he wanted to go, you know, uh, you know Green Day, right? Take him to see Green Day. Then he wanted to go see Slipknot, and then he got hooked on, you know, Co- he comes he comes to me one day and starts playing a song "Welcome Home" from Coheed and Cambria. Yeah. You know, which I didn't introduce him to, and it was and it was great because then now he wanted to go see them, right? So now it's like I got a son that's a rocker; he's into all this stuff, and you know, then he got into even some of the older stuff. You know, he like he would say, "Hey, I found this cool song," and it would be like you know something from Blue Oyster Cult or something from you know uh, you know uh, Quiet Riot or uh, you know Warrant, right? And it's like, wow, I didn't introduce him to those bands either, but you know those. You know, he, he kind of had this track of stuff, and he kind of leans towards more the the classic stuff. He likes a lot of '90s and a lot of alternative stuff now, but you know that's what it was. My daughter, the the she was always kind of into all the the newer rock, uh, emo rock, uh, emo screamo kind of type scene. But it was funny one time she put her iPad in, you know, her iPod in on my car because she wanted to listen to some tunes. And the next thing you know, like a Misfits song comes on. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, and I'm like, you like the Misfits? And she's just like, she's like, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, you know, these guys are like from when I was in school, right? And she's like, yeah. She's like, yeah, I know. She goes, they've been around for a while. So, um, so you know, it's, it's, it's great to kind of influence, you know, that, that you know, when, uh, when they're influencing the rock and it's, you know, and rock is a different animal, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's different from pop music and it's, you know, and it, and it always has been, and it's always been, you know, kind of that thing. I mean, I, when we look, when we look at like some of the rock bands now and we, and we, and we see how they're not the focus anymore. Right. You know, the focus is on all these other artists that, uh, I don't know. I, I, I call them all like, drone music because to me it's all this auto tune and it really it really does like i don't really kind of get it and every once in a while there might be a song that's on that pop side or even like maybe more on the alternative rock side that that kind of generates something where i'd be interested in it but most of it's all kind of the same thing yeah. when you listen to a lot of those bands are all kind of the same thing or a variation of the same thing the, the the clever thing about like the rock bands, you know, you could kind of differentiate between, you know, all the bands. Like if I look at all, you look at all the bands in the book, they're all kind of variations of different styles. Mm-hmm. And even when they kind of cross into the same style, like if we, you know, we could sit there and talk about, uh, and, and we've talked about ACDC, and then you talk about like a an Airborne, but then like I have like Rhino Bucket is in the book. And then, like, you know, they're all different variations that sound like ACDC, but none of them really sound like ACDC. Right. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, they kind of have their own little thing that's going. And that's always kind of the, the cool thing of, you know, uh, of how, like, rock music is, is that, I mean, do we have bands? Are there bands that are kind of 
cookie cutter kind of sound like the same thing. I always argued about uh, like the, I know Greta Von Fleet always gets a lot of flack because they sound like uh, you know they're like the Led Zeppelin clones. I personally I personally like the band. I think there's something about them that makes them stand out that people are drawn to them. Uh, but if I let my if I let my uh, my wife listen to you know she hears a Greta Von Fleet song. She'll immediately point out and say, they kind of remind me of the Black Crows. And I'm kind of like, you know, I got to sit there and take a step back and think about it. And like, yeah, you know what? To some degree, they kind of have a Black Crows thing going. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of defeats the audience. But, but I guess it really depends on who listens to it. She's not really a fan of Led Zeppelin either. So that could be the other thing why she doesn't she doesn't uh, she doesn't catch on that. Yeah, she also um, might be equating some of the Greta Van Fleet stuff too to the to the looseness too that they're not everything they do isn't like played to the grid and you know so Black Crows they had that looseness too and that that kind of swing yeah. feel in there and maybe that's what she's picking up on. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that you know it, it's. Um, and I'm sure she'll kill me later. And I told, hey, I talked about you in the uh, podcast here. But it, you know, it, it's uh, my, my. It's funny because when we listen to songs, and you know, she's not really a she's not a hard rock metal person, and uh, not that I would ever try to convert her. But it's funny, like when I'll play a song, and then how she'll describe certain bands. And the best one, the best one I ever heard, and this a number of years ago. I'm playing uh, a Zebra song, and I can't remember whether it was. Uh, uh, tell me what you want or who's behind the door was one of those type songs and she's listening to it and the first thing she says was it sounds like sounds like a combination of uh emerson lake and palmer and uh frankie valley <laughs> and i was like I, I almost whipped the truck over because i was laughing so hard but but it was like you know what when you listen to stuff and then you sit there and you you know she says it i'm laughing but then i'm sitting there going i'm going huh you know, because all this time I'm sitting there thinking a lot of people compared Zebra to a little bit like Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, but yeah, I could actually see where, and, and I think that's what's the great thing about, you know, I can have writing these books, have a certain interpretation about a band, and then there's somebody else that's going to read it and have a, a totally different uh, opinion about what that band sounds like or what that album sounded like. Right. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of music anyway, of, of any type of music, or in this case, when we're talking about, you know, rock bands and rock songs and, and albums, is that everybody has a different interpretation of what they, what they hear. Right. Because everybody's, everybody's ears are picking up something different. So, like, you know, if I'm sitting there saying something about, you know, a certain, you know, certain song with, uh, you know, how great it sounds, how the tone sounds, the guitars, the drumming's phenomenal. Somebody else might pick up something up and, you know, something else and say, hey, you know what, that bass player's killer. You totally missed the point. He drives the whole, he, if it wasn't for him, this album would, would stink, you know, and you know what? So if somebody sends me a comment like that, I'd have to sit there and go, hmm, maybe I got to listen to that again and focus more on what that bass player is doing specifically. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I have that all the time. It's not really an argument. It's more like a, just a kind of beating on each other, but I have that with my girlfriend yeah. all the time where she f focuses in on drums and vocalists. And then yeah. I'm always focusing in more on guitar and uh, the mixing and the mastering and the interplay and whether things collide with each other or whatever. So there's yeah. things where she'll just be like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't even hear that. Um, and then mm -hmm. she'll like something for some reason that it's got this awesome little drum thing in there. Like when it does the, the, the timpani stuff on, uh, one of the Jeffrey's songs, she's, Oh, I just love that part. And it's, and, uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is kind of what your ears are attuned to and what you just naturally listen for that drive you to look at and listen to things differently. Yeah. And, and it's just the, uh, every, I mean, cause, cause really the group, the best part about music is the content and all the, all the, you know, everything that gets thrown into a, a song mm -hmm. that, you know, and again, when I focus and, and maybe some of it was because, uh, you know, I, 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 when I, when I like something, I get drawn into it. So it's like, you know, if it's a, if it's a vocalist that I really like, like, I know, like, um, like if I, uh, I was always a huge fan of Dokken, mm -hmm. right. And, and Don Dokken, Don Dokken, in my opinion, obviously, you know, he's over the, over the years, He's kind of struggled vocally, but I don't care. Don Dockin in his prime 
was top-notch vocalist, and I could listen to Don all day. Hi, this is Don Dawkin, and you're listening to Focus on Metal, one of the greatest rock shows on the planet. Keep listening, and keep rocking with Dawkin. And, you know, when you listen, you know, my focus was to always listen to Don's vocals, and then, you know, the rest of the band complimented everything that he did. Mm-hmm. And his docking wasn't the way they were. I mean, George Lynch, George Lynch being the guitarist in that band, and, and, I, and I'll give some credit. There's John Levin is an amazing guitarist, too. And there's some amazing work that Don Dockin has done since mm-hmm. uh, with, with John Levin on guitar. So there's there's two different styles. But when I listen to it, as long as Don is, the, Don has always been the focal point of that band. And then that's what I'm always drawn to. But the other thing that really comes into play is how great the background harmonies are when you get Mick Brown and Jeff Pilson in that mm-hmm. mix. And, you know, if you didn't have that, I don't think that's the same band. And I, like, and I always attributed, like, bands like Dokken and King's X is another favorite of mine mm-hmm. that I think if you took away the vocal harmonies, I don't know if that band is if that band is as good as as they as they are. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's the sum of the parts yeah. that you know kind of go in. And I think there's you know there's some bands where a vocalist can just you know stand on their own and that's it. It doesn't matter you know it doesn't matter who's behind them, right? It could be a bunch of kids playing pots and bands, right. and this guy sounds like a million dollars every time, right? But there are certain bands where you know it's just kind of like you know if you were listening to like Primus. And Les, Les Claypool's not playing bass, right? And <laughs> yeah. it's like, you know, you're kind of sitting there like, like that's kind of the driving force. It's kind of one of the reasons why you, you, you listen to some of those songs. Like, man, what what is he doing, right? Because you're sitting there going, man, first of all, what is he doing? First of all, and then the second part, how's he doing it, right? right. And, and these are the things, and these are the things that are missed. These are things that are missed in a lot of music today. And it's really unfortunate that, you know, that we, we don't have where we're talking about brilliant new guitarists or vocalists and stuff. I mean, they're out there, but they're not getting, they're not getting nearly the attention that they would have gotten if they came out in, you know, even early two thousands. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, uh, you know and, and, and it's, just, it's a shame. There's so many, there's so many bands that are in a box right now uh, that, you know, that would be, you know, it would be massive. If, if given the opportunity, they would, they would be, absolutely massive instead of being in this this little box i almost think that rock sometimes gets put in a spot like uh, jazz music mm-hmm. was you know like jazz and big band were a big deal at one point then rock and roll came in and then jazz took a back seat yeah you know and, and i think unfortunately that's 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 where rock is at at this point because there's you know all this other uh stuff that's out there um, like country music's always been out there, right? But now even country's kind of even country's kind of gone more into even more into the pop and the hip hop and and all that stuff. So um, you know, but that's why you see some of these rock bands now um, really kind of going into you know kind of kind of meshing in with the you know kind of like how the rock artists would bring the rap artists in back in the day. Now you're starting to see some of these pop artists actually kind of branch out into the rock world, yeah. right? And and so now we're seeing that kind of thing. And I know there's a lot of people that are, you know, not really uh, enjoying that much. But there's there's some there's some things to be said about that. That uh, you know, if if keeping rock alive means that pop artists need to jump ship and kind of do rock style albums or hard rock albums. Um, you know, it, it, it might be a trend. It might be a trend. Uh, mm-hmm. obviously uh, the, the word is still out on whether that's, uh, whether that's going to be successful or not, but, um, yeah. it is, it is worth a shot. I mean, uh, rock artists have always been crossing over to pop. So, you know, why wouldn't it be the other way, the other way around? So. Right. Right. You know, one other thing I want to, I just want to point out too, is, uh, is the cover. I thought the cover was really, really well done. And I looked at it and, and I, you know, from uh, kind of put the graphic designer hat on and it's like, okay, so, you know, you got that record coming out of the sleeve and it must have been interesting when that got designed to be like, okay, so I know that to make this thing a rectangular book, I probably don't want to have, you know, and I need to have enough space to write everything. So I'm going to make this album cover 
it's not going to be square. We're going to be a little bit more rectangular. So we're, it's kind of, it goes away from your traditional look. But if you look really quick, you don't notice it. It's just this like really clever thing that looks like an album falling out of a sleeve. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, and and uh, and I'll and I'll give some credit out to uh, uh, Kevin McElroy from uh, McElroy Creative Media. Mm. He was he was the person that that created the original underrated rock book cover, and this this act this actual version uh, for underrated rock book two was actually he had designed originally two covers for me, mm. and then we I uh, put them out to a, a few people to kind of get some opinions and. Of course, uh, the underrated rock book got the cover that was uh, that that became the actual cover, and then this was the one that lost out. So then, when this book was ready, I reached back out to Kevin and I said, "Listen, I want this cover, and but you know, but I want to obviously change uh, the you know because that that one also had said underrated rock book. I said we're gonna need to make an underrated rock book too. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he's very uh, very creative." Um, I think that, um, you know, when you look at it, yeah, it does look like it's got, you know, uh, like it looks like the album's coming right out of sleeve and it's, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's, and it's a, it's, it's a genius look. And, uh, you know, and, and again, it kind of ties in with, you know, with the, with the theme, uh, of, of, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do here. Obviously the, the top part also has kind of that little 45 yep. RPM spindle thing. So, yeah, no, I thought it was really cool. And, and when I first saw it, the first thought I had with the colors, with everything is it reminded me so much of Aerosmith live bootleg. It, it just, it's, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, I'm, and now, now that you're saying it, I'm sitting there going, yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, yeah, I could I could see that. Yeah, you, know, you got absolutely. a little wear, the muted color. You got a couple of stainings. It was, and it just, and it's yeah. probably because I, and I'm sure you did the same thing too. You buy an album, you put it on, and then you read all the line notes and you'd stare at the cover. Yep. And I don't can't tell you the number of hours I stared at the live bootleg co- cover, especially the big spread in in the middle of it. But yeah, that's the first thing I saw this thing and I thought, oh, it looks like live bootleg. Yeah, well, even in the two section, the wings kind of give it off like it's a um, true, like it's yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely. Stuff. I mean, everything everything about the book and everybody that's kind of put their stuff together, uh, it's been it's been great. Mm. Uh, and you know, and I appreciate everybody that's been a, that's been a part of this. You know, to 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 kind of be and, and and there's been a lot of people, and I thank a lot of people in in both books, um, just for the just for the support and for the, um, you know, some of the, some of the submissions that people give and uh, you know mentioning of bands because really, I mean, there's there's stuff that people think about um, that I never, you know, uh, there's some artists that you know they either either I forgot about or didn't realize they sang a certain song. Mm. And then, you know, they'd kind of bring it up and then that would be kind of the, the you know, kind of the theme there. And, uh, you know, if I didn't have some of those people that have been uh, been very supportive and again, those ones that have been looking and itching for me to finish a second copy of the book. Uh, there's a lot of them that are very excited to see what's going to be in in the pages here. So, yeah, um, so definitely looking, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. And, and they're not going to have long to wait. Right. I mean, this this comes out on October 12th. October twelfth, yeah. So it's uh, so it's it's going to start off on Amazon first. Um, October twelfth is the official release date for uh, the Kindle version. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I got to kind of do some stuff to try to see if the if the paperback version can come out the same day. Mm-hmm. It may be delayed a little bit, um, but um, but you know the the idea is that it's going to come out around the same time. Like nobody that wants paperback is going to have to wait a week, right? Um, so if I, if I do everything right, it'll come out sometime the same day and um and we'll go you know and we'll kind of go from there um and uh then once once it's out of there then uh we'll start putting it on some other some other sites hmm. uh especially for like the the kindle versions there's a lot of different uh sites like the like the barnes and noble and stuff like that um but but amazon's going to be the place the, the main place to go and for anybody really to to, to check out um, the book, even for the first book, uh, underratedrockbook.com dot com, is uh, is the primary place that anybody can go and and kind of start there. Read about the 
read about the information that I'm doing regarding uh, both books. Um, but then if, you know, they can go to a link right to Amazon, it will take them right to uh, the, the links for the, uh, the original Underrated Rock book. And then right now there's a Kindle pre-order going on uh, up until the 12th. And then, uh, then we'll have the paperback version as well. Um, but also, if you go into Amazon, you just type in Underrated Rock Book or Underrated Rock Book 2, uh, the information will come up there as well. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it would almost be ironic that if the paperback got delayed, because I, I know that when I'm ordering physical media and I still order a ton of it, it seems like with the plants being overwhelmed that if I order vinyl, it's going to be weeks. In some cases, it's actually been months before I eventually get the vinyl. But the CD, it comes in pretty much right on that Friday release date. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, granted, I mean, you know, we can't can't always count on what is uh, what's happening, you know, mm. with uh, with the mail and postage and all that stuff. Right. So right. there's always delays of everything, but hopefully uh, people won't have to wait uh, too long. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I got to tell you, Jim, I'm, I'm psyched to, to talk to you again. It's been a while, but uh, it's, it was, you know, this book, obviously a great read. And I'm still going to have to pick up a physical copy as well because I'm just that kind of person. So uh, yep. I'll definitely be hitting that Amazon link. But uh, yeah, like I said, it's, it's been great. It, it sounds like probably we're not going to see a third, but maybe something you're thinking about something different. And, and when you are, I certainly would love to have you back on again and, and help you promote it. And uh, yeah, I'm, you know, anytime, just hit me up. All right. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate that. And uh, we'll never say never on the uh, on Underrated Rock Book 3 or whatever we decide mm. to call it. Um, but yeah, if we, uh, if I do something else and, uh, definitely, uh, you'll, you'll be on my list so we can uh, definitely uh, talk some more about music for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. All Thanks right. a lot, Jim. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate the time. Hi, this is George Lynch. Doc and Lynch Mob, Souls of Wii, and you're listening to Focus on Metal. Yeah, I figured why not throw one more ID in there, and then I get IDs for the entire original band all in one show. It seemed to thematically work with all the stuff that uh, Jim was talking about with Dokken and stuff and Rockstar and all that. So what the hell? Why not do it, right? So there you go. Great talk with author Jim Santora. And if you want to find out more about the books, you can go, as he said, to underratedrockbook.com. Good stuff, as we were talking about. And it's one of those things you want to reach back into your musical memory banks. This one's great for that. If you want to look at discovering some new stuff, this is great for that as well. All Overall, like I said, an enjoyable read. Something you don't have to do all in one go. You can take it bits and pieces. And uh, yeah, honestly, good stuff. I mean, that is why... I had Jim back on. He contacted me a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'd love to do that. Hey, let me read the book first and everything, and it was just as good as the first one, and it was, yep, let's get you on. Let's talk about this. Let's get the word out. So, again, the uh, pre-order for the Kindle is going on now until October 12th, and you should also be able to start getting to be able to order the actual physical copies if you want those coming up soon on Amazon first, and as he talked about, It'll go out from there. And if you go up to underratedrockbook.com, you can see all the different bookstores that are distributing Underrated Rock Book, his first volume. So you've got plenty of places to pick that one up. So lots of irons in the fire for the uh, next show. Could be another segment of our Iron Maiden series. Could be a little project we're working on for the uh, self-titled Lynch Mob album, which, of course, is the second Lynch Mob album. So lots of stuff there, lots of great chats. Not sure what we're doing for the next one. And hey, in the meantime, between now and then, something else could creep in as well. But uh, for this week, that's it. There ain't no more. Stick a fork in it. This puppy is done. So for myself, Richie, and everybody else here at Focus on Metal, have yourselves a great metal week. And until we talk to you again next time, remember... Focus on Metal! is insignificant.
still here. It's over. Go home.